everybody. I hear you're talking to Kello. Kello is kind of nicer than I. Is it? Uh, okay, you're nicer than me. Fine, I'll take that. <laughs> I, I'm not here to be nice. I was just about to say, on the other hand, it's not like it's a high high target to achieve. <laughs> Being nicer than me? Okay, so, cool. Yeah. So anyway, hello. Hello, everybody. I am the developer in this duo. I'm Mario. A random fact about me is this show is airing on uh, 7th March of 2023. And on 9th of March 2023, which is in two days, if anybody's listening in time, uh, I'm playing a concert. My band is playing a concert in Zagreb at Club Sax. Uh, please come one, come all. It's a tribute to grunge bands from the 90s, but in acoustic unplugged versions. So it's nice. You can sit down, drink a lot of beer and watch us make fool out of ourselves. Uh, so all fans of Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, you're more than welcome to join. And the band is called Citizen Dick. For those of you who get the uh, uh, analogy and who know what Citizen Dick is, shout out to all of you guys. Shout out to Cameron Crowe. Shout out to Matt Dillon. And yeah, that's the random fact about me. Go, Tom. I'm sure Matt Dillon is listening to this podcast, but uh, <laughs> my name is Tom. And hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm the designer in this too. Uh, a quick random fact about me. Uh, so my wife's a veterinary surgeon, and uh, today I'm drinking from her cup. So whoever's watching, uh, this is this is her cup, and whoever is listening, it has a depiction of a uh, well, the way you examine different sides of animals. Let's keep it polite. <laughs> okay, you might want to switch on YouTube for this one. Yeah, uh, you had a, you had an idea for for the today's topic. So you you tell us what the topic is, and then we'll dive. Yes, in. today's topic was my idea. I'm so smart. Uh, today's topic is interviews, job interviews, uh, position interviews, sometimes sales pitches, things like that. But basically, how to think of one, how to prepare on one, how to perform on one, and so on. So, Tom, I know you have an interview today, so yeah. what uh, are you supposed to be doing instead of doing this? So, if I'm being completely honest, I don't prepare for interviews anymore uh, in terms of uh, how would I pitch myself. I've done that so many times that it, I kind of can repeat it in my sleep. Uh, and I found it personally that it's kind of better to come off more real and unprepared and more personal than having a pitch that is, oh, hello, my name is Tom and I'm a designer. But it kind of comes off prepare disingenuous, at least I think. So only thing that I do prepare uh, now is kind of research what the company does and how I would fit into the company. So the, the, the company today is a very specific type of uh, client. They do like AI analysis of sensor data from construction. So like the dryness and thickness of concrete and stuff like that. So based on that data, then they will help companies plan their uh, construction time and when they need to be at a construction place and whatever. So it's a very specific thing, uh, but the product itself is a, uh, is a map that those people use that get the, collect all the sensor data, all the stuff that then gets presented. So uh, they need a product design consultant. They reached out to me. So today we're going to have a conversation. And in terms of how I interview, and I, I can talk a lot about how my interviews look like when I was younger and less experienced to how they look like today. And I'm sure that a lot of people, especially people who are more in like the beginning of their career, are you're eager to please. And you want to present as I know everything, like this is me and I can do all of those things. And I just had an interaction a couple of days ago on LinkedIn about this, where it was my post was about you need to niche down and be like a ninja between all of the warriors. Like you're not a regular grunt Joe, you need to be a specific type of assassin. And uh, one of the comments that I got from a very young person is like, oh, but I need to be jack of all trades so I can 
help my clients do all of the things. And that's true to uh, to a sense to in, in sense of that person said like, hey, I'm starting my own business. I need to learn all of these things. And yes, you need to be learning everything around your business that is not related to what you do as a service. So when I started being, uh, I started my first company as a designer, like, of course I know web design, of course I know the front end, I know graphic design. I'm like, these are the design skills that I do. But then there were all of these different things that I had to learn that I had no idea or way for me when I started my first company from understanding taxes and understanding uh, sales funnels and sales process and all of these things that would help me a lot if I read a couple of books before starting my first business. But when you are talking to your clients, especially if you're interviewing for a specific position, a lot of people tend to come from a perspective of this is who I am and this is what I do, right? Like me, 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 me. I'm great. I'm a designer, blah, blah, blah. And I've changed that. I don't care. Yeah, I changed that a couple of years ago where uh, I've noted, to be honest, I changed my positioning, how I present myself when I started hiring. So when I started to do hiring and when I started hiring designers, and at that point I realized, man, I don't give a shit about your portfolio. I don't care. Uh, I would get this, uh, links to these portfolios, like majority of people who applied are great designers. So, and then you're again in a sea of, you're a great designer in a sea of great designers. So what makes you different, right? You all know Figma and Sketch and you can do this and build the design system, blah, blah, blah. Like on paper, everybody's the same. And this kind of made me aware that when people are interviewing, they don't care about what I know. Like once I've, once you cross the threshold, like, okay, you've satisfied the norm, you know all of these things, how can we fit you in what we do? And now when I talk to, to either a prospective customer or a company or whoever, it's more from a perspective of this is the problem that I'm solving for you. And this is how it reflects on your bottom line, whether it's monetary or I'm going to speed up your team. I'm going to help your product go to market quicker. I talk about things that I know concern them. They don't care about a design system and what fonts and colors I'm going to use. They don't give a shit. They want to know it. I'm going to tell them like, oh, we got to build this in this amount of time. I'm going to help your team. I'm going to communicate clear. I'm going to make sure everybody knows what they're doing. And then they're like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. And one of the analogies that I used a couple of years ago was that I consider myself to be those uh, paratrooping firefighters that jump behind into the fire and then put it out from the inside. And I spoke to one of the CTOs of the company. He was like, this is great, actually. This is something that we need because he doesn't know what a design system is. Like, he knows what it is, but he never built one. He doesn't care. He wouldn't care if I told him, like, oh, I'm going to build this system, but a design system by implementing those. The, the, blah, 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 blah. Like, he doesn't give a shit. So he would be like, what can you do to help me achieve my goals as a CTO? Okay, I can do this, this, and this. This is how I plug into the team. This is what I do. This is how I'm going to make the product team faster, whatever. How one of the, I know that from a designer's perspective, one of the important things that CTOs and technical people want to hear is how I'm going to communicate with development team and how I'm going to make development team faster, better, more clear on what the goal is, what do they need to do? Because developers from my experience of learn, hate asking additional questions and having the unknowns where they're building something. So if you come to a developer with, this is what you're building, this is what this thing needs to do, this is how it looks like, this is how it behaves, this is the end result of this process, and everything's here for you, go. And they're like, great. And why? This is why we are building it. Exactly. So, so... Well, the why should be handled by either the stakeholders or I rarely concern myself with the why. It's, it should come from people who are building the product, people who are behind the company. So they should know the why. I'm, when I'm hired uh, to a team as a freelancer, I'm rarely concerned with why. I understand why, but I don't convey the North Star in somebody else's job. I can do that. Uh, no, no. but I didn't meet the why regarding the North Star, but primarily if you're talking about design, then you say, okay, we're going to break this form into a five-step wizard. And the, the developers are going to say, oh my God, this is a five-step wizard. This is a pain in the ass to do. I have to think about all the steps. Why the hell is he doing this? To explain to them, this is why it's better. Because a five-step wizard is much easier for users. Yeah. One sentence only, but kind of, for me, it's always easy to get a broader picture about what I'm doing 
and then I can understand why I'm doing it. 100%. So I, when I was younger, I worked with people who would say things like, well, I would ask why, why are we doing this like this or like that? And I would say, because I say so. And I hate that sentence of because I say so. I heard it since I was a kid in school. I heard it from 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 my parents when I was a kid. Like I just grow to loathe the sentence because I say so. So when I'm working with anybody, I, if I cannot explain the reasoning behind the decisions that I made as a designer, that means that I did a piss poor job and you have every right to question me. I have that situation with my kids. So she's now six. And when she was, you know, pouting about stuff, then we, we would like, but what's, why are you pouting? And she was like, because. And we were, okay, because is not an answer. But now she comes to us and says, Daddy, why are you doing that? Oh, because. Shut up, just do it. Because is not an mm-hmm. answer, Daddy. Damn you. <laughs> Smart kid. She takes off her yes. mother, I'm assuming. To, yeah. Uh, hopefully she'll get her looks after her mother as well, because, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no. Yeah. There's uh, a reason so why anyway, people are listening your... to this podcast, not watching it. <laughs> Uh, that would make their lives much better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I got so, sidetracked. Uh, no, yeah. is that possible on this one? Uh, but basically, you opened up too many topics, and I have too many responses. <laughs> Go, please. We have time. So, I'm not in a hurry. Whoever's listening to this is not step- in a hurry. If you're listening, please subscribe. This is what I heard that we should say to people: subscribe to our thing. Uh, oh yeah, we should subtly, we should subtly like uh, implement that. That every like six sentences we make, you know, a ding, uh, a subscribe thing. <laughs> we can even have like a bell, and then have the Pablo reflex. You know, you ring a bell, and then you mention the word subscribe, and then you later on just ring the bell. We'll figure something out. Uh, so, going back to what you said, first thing you said was you don't prepare because you've done it so many times. Doing it so many times. I would actually call preparation. So for anybody who is thinking about interviews, there are several things that are going to happen in an interview. The first thing is they are going to ask you, regardless whether it's a job interview, whether it's an interview where you're pitching your company to another company, where you're pitching your... They are going to ask you something about you. And they're going to ask you this in every interview. So imagine if if you were to prepare this... (laughs) And instead of stammering, instead of, you know, having trouble, instead of thinking about what you're going to say, that you actually have five sentences that you want to say about who you are, what you do, what are your main projects, and what are your main skills. It doesn't have to be, you know, learned by heart. So to say, hey, I'm a Mario, I'm a developer, I work in a company called Intelligence, and we do. You can do it natural, but you need to know which, like a one-sentence pitch of yourself, which three main skills you would like to promote, which three main references or or testimonials you would like to promote, and that's it for the initial intro. The next, and this is something that you can practice in front of a mirror, sit down, do it 20 times. After you do it 20 times, you can never have to practice it until the end of your life. But you do have to do it 20 times, and you do have to become comfortable with it. And uh, you do have to believe that it's amazing, but if the people have actually given you testimonials about hey, we worked with Mario and he's a great uh, engineer. We would love to hire him again. There's no reason not to believe them. So you are apparently doing something well. So if you have like people who said that you do something well, then believe it and then convey the fact that you're believing. When you're in a bar arguing about whether Pearl Jam is the best band ever, you're going to have so much enthusiasm telling them they are. Have the same enthusiasm telling them, hey, I'm confident that I'm a great engineer. Just convey the same, convey the same thing. The next thing you mentioned was preparation about them. So the concept of a job interview isn't what you can do. It is sort of what you can do, but it's what you can do for them. So if you're on a job interview for a development position, they are, your potential employer is interested in how much value you can bring to them. Don't focus on what you do, focus on what you can do for them. how a few practical tips that I used to uh, employ. So I used to work through Toptel and they would, you know, uh, find you clients and they would send you to interviews with clients. 
a few good things that you can prepare before a job interview is if they have a product, go online on their website and learn everything about them. Check out what they do and find a few things that you find annoying. For you as a designer, if you find a website having this and this, you can say, okay, this section is maybe a little bit unclear. It would be much clearer if it was presented this way. Find five of those. If they have a product, go log in and find, find, find three or five places which are really annoying. Like this validation doesn't make sense. This form looks cluttered. This, it doesn't have to, even, even if they have a perfect product, the things that you find, they don't have to be uh, on spot. You don't have to actually find a mistake or find crap. You have to find a thing that sort of annoys you, that you have an opinion about. And then in the interview, voice your opinion on it. It shows several things. A, it shows on the interview that you've actually done your exploration. People love other people who uh, uh, spend their time preparing for a task and doing the task like it should be. So if you're talking to me and you explored all about my company, that's going to mean to me. That's going to raise my ego. That's going to show me that you pay attention. That's going to show me that you're putting in an effort. And I like that in a potential employee. I like that in a potential partner. I like that in a potential whoever I'm talking to. So if you actually put in effort and analysis and some work, you will do better. The second thing is you will show that you actually have opinions. You will not necessarily blindly listen to orders. There are people who like working with people who blindly listen to orders. I'm not one of them. I want my employees. I want my partners. I want my clients. I want everybody to challenge me because if I make a decision, I know you all know I am, but I'm. there is a small chance that I'm not the smartest person in the world and that there might exist people who have uh, uh, better ideas than I and who have uh, uh, constructio constructive objections to my ideas. So yes, challenge me. So it shows that and see, it shows that you have an interest in making the whole thing better. And if you are showing me that your interest is making my product better, hell yeah, <laughs> I'm in. So, uh, uh, that part of preparation is fairly easy to do. Sign up for a demo, go to the website, go to the social networks, watch their videos, like spend an hour researching that and write down a few questions. And then when you get to that part of the interview where they ask, do you have any questions? And you will get to that part of the interview where they ask, do you have any questions? Never say no. If you say no, then you are saying, I don't care about this. I don't care about any questions. Just, yeah, give me the money and let's go. Nobody, th that's not a plus. Always have a question. And if you've done your research in advance, you can actually have some constructive questions that can lead into a constructive discussion that can lead. And then you automatically leave a better impression. At least that's what worked for me a lot when I was doing interviews either for positions and now nowadays that's working for me a lot when i'm doing sort of pre-sales talks about you know how, how the cooperation is going to work one thing um that i would mention to this is it's easy to not have questions when you don't care so my advice would be <laughs> to actually apply for companies that you really want to work at or with clients that you actually want to work with. There are situations when you need to make money and then you really don't care and you have to act like you care, but it's going to be so much easier if you are actually interested in the product in the company and you want to be part of that team or want to build whatever they're building. Uh, and if you don't... But if I can just butt in, yeah. it's easier not to ask questions and not care. It's even easier not to go for interviews. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You just sit on a couch, you don't do anything. It's the easiest thing ever <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true but um one thing that you mentioned is when you are researching your client i like to when i'm mentoring uh freelancers and getting people in general i want to everybody's talking about uh who is your ideal customer who is your target whatever you want to work and then everybody's advising to have this avatar of this ideal type of company you want to work with or whatever and I always found that advice kind of dumb because at the end of the day, we want to work 
with companies that are nice to work with, that will pay yeah. us, and that will give us some interesting and challenging things to do. It's a very broad spectrum of things, right? But one thing that you can change is who you are for a client. Like not what is that client for me, but who you are for them. Why are you the person they want to work with? Like I said, when you're applying as a designer or a developer, you're one out of hundreds. So it doesn't matter. But if, if they are, for example, a uh, outdoor sports brand, right? And they do outdoor sports brand stuff or an app or whatever, Under Armour. And you are a type of person that wakes up at six in the morning, goes for a run, and then goes mountain biking before you have your first coffee. And you're a designer or a developer. And you tell them, like, I'm the type of person that uses your product. I want to work with you or for you because this is the type of lifestyle that I believe in. And this is the type of thing that I actually use and want to be part of. And then it's easier to say, okay, I'm a type of person that I believe in whatever. And then you search for that types of companies that are aligned with the things that you believe in. Then it's so much easier to work on a product or a project that it's, like, I would never work for a gambling website because I think it's it's wrong. So I don't give a shit, right? So if a gambling site comes to me and says like, hey, we need you to build a UX patterns that's going to help people stay on our website longer and spend more money. I would be like, fuck you very much. I don't give a shit. Like you and your Vegas bullshit. And and, and this is something that I don't want to do. But there are people who are more than happy to do that. And then on the other hand, I have zero problems with working for a porn website. I don't care. Like this is something that I enjoy. I think it's amazing. And if I can help bring their UX uh, to forefront and make it better experience, then yes, of course I'm going to work. So you need to find something that aligns with what you really love. Uh, and and think about that, like who you are for your customer. Incidentally, I have not had personal experience uh, uh, working on uh, uh, in the porn industry, but I have some colleagues that did, and they actually told me that it's amazingly challenging and that the tax stacks are amazingly advanced because of the high load, because of the high demand, and because of the requirements for simplicity for user experience, that actually working on uh, uh, adult websites and adult apps is technically freaking amazing. Yeah, uh, I've I have a one of my talks is uh, called uh, "Not Safe for Work UX," where I talk about user experience of the old in, adult industry and how adult industry actually not just affected but pushed forward the technical evolution of a lot of things that we are using today. And I don't want to go into that topic. Maybe we can talk about that some next time. But uh, there's, for example, I'm going to use this one example that you mentioned, technical stuff. For example, one of the biggest website that I'm not going to name here, but we all know which one it is, the Origin Black one, has a video player that is way more advanced than YouTube's or Facebook's. And if you are a long time user, then you will notice how much YouTube actually stole from them, right? In terms of UX and usability of and how the, the actual player performs and how it does. And then there was years ago before they, they screwed up Tumblr, one of the things that was uh, in UX uh, of Tumblr was when you would play a video uh, and then you would scroll away, the video would detach and then go on the side while you're scrolling away. And then Facebook just copied that. They were like, thank you. This is great. We're going to borrowed, 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 yeah, got yeah. inspired by. Yeah, inspired by, exactly. So there's there are great things being done in terms of UX and technology on site that have this large volume. And I spoke with, a, I had a conversation with a dude that was a lead UX in one of these major websites that I'm not going to now promote. And they would do A-B testing on the landing page in seconds. And they would get millions of hits in seconds. They can literally test a position of a button and run 100,000 people test within a minute. And they would get a result and say, okay, this is better. So imagine doing that rapid A-B testing on everything that you do. And only a couple of websites in the whole world can do that, considering the volume that they have. Uh, so that was like an interesting conversation, but I think it's a way different topic from uh, interviewing or uh, interviewing for a position 
or or something. But I mentioned that I changed my perspective when I started hiring. And I would like to hear what you think about that because you were nodding while I were talking. So I, I think you have something <laughs> to say. Uh, so when I was doing my last round of hiring, I actually managed to find a couple of really great people. Uh, uh, shout out to Nicola, shout out to Christian. But uh, I also got some very interesting applications. And if you go to my blog, mariomutsalo.com, you will find an article that's called something like Top 8 Advice How Not to Get a Job. These are all advices that actually happened to me. So I'll start with the basics. First of all, if you're like applying for a position, so not even at the interview, but applying for a position, make sure you make as many spelling errors in your CV. Having a spell checker that's built into Word or any other text processor and actually using it is preposterous. Don't ever do that. Why would you do that? Why would you show that you care about presentation? Screw it. They'll understand if you mess up everything. What's the problem? Who cares about paying attention to detail? Your potential employer for sure doesn't. The next thing you do, and the bonus mistakes are the best mistakes. I actually had a candidate send in their CV with their personal name and the name of the city they are from in lowercase. And if you think this was a stylish decision, it was not because in the next line, the street was written properly with uppercases as it should be. So, Gah! that's my best comment. The next thing, uh, when you send in your CV, don't send it from a mail that has like first name dot last name at gmail.com or first name dot last name at some domain.com or something like that. Send it from your personal email. If your personal email is queen the queen bitch at gmail.com, send it from the queen bitch at email.com. It's not like that's gonna look unprofessional, it's gonna look amazing. If Samuel L. Jackson can go around and say that he's a big bad motherfucker, why couldn't you? Uh, the next one is when you come into an actual Zoom video or a Zoom interview or uh, any sort of video conference interview, you have your name written down there. You could, for example, have uh, uh, your first name and last name there, but you could also say something completely relevant. I had an interview with a guy who was supposed to take over something that my company was doing. He came in, didn't turn on his camera, and his name in the, I believe it was a Zoom call, was the dog of the universe in lowercase. So I literally wanted to come to a guy and say, hey, dog, hey, Mr. Dog, how do I call you? Mr. Universe, how do I call you? So don't do that. I mean, these are basics. And this actually happened to me on my interviews. But the next one, and this is also sort of connected to preparation that I wanted to ask you about, is um, you have a big portfolio. You've done a bunch of projects. And you probably have like three of those or five of those that you are most proud of. And if I asked you now, you know, to our viewers who are completely uh, ambiguous of the whole thing, show us three of your uh, examples of your work you would show some three that you like. But I assume that if you're interviewing for a company that does something in, with concrete and AI, that you would think about, okay, these three are my favorite, but they won't care about those three. They're going to care about these three. And then you would open them up just so you have them in some browser tab if they ask you, okay, what have you done? So that you can show them. Am I correct? No, Absolutely. yes. So... When, when presenting portfolio, I usually try to show what's relevant to them. So if I'm working with an AI company and, or for example, today, when I will be talking to these guys, uh, I'm going to have my past project, which was also an AI driven product ready. Uh, but also I will have, uh, one from before that is very data heavy because I know these are data heavy. So I want to show them. I worked with a couple of projects that for whatever reason, I was pushed into B2B products and dashboards and stuff. Uh, I never was, I was never kind of interested in doing stuff like 
new social network or new Facebook or new Snapchat. I don't give a shit about that. But I kind of felt that solving problems within B2B uh, software is more kind of more challenging, more, more interesting. So I have a couple of really data heavy, charts heavy dashboards that I built that display different types of data in different types of ways. And these guys will probably want to see that, or I can show them and say like, hey, I built this. This was a massive project. Well, I worked on one of the dashboards that uh, was a couple of years back that did. You can control, uh, imagine like, for example, WeWork. It wasn't WeWork, but let's imagine WeWork. It has hundreds of buildings across the globe. So what you can do is you can see your entire energy consumption globally right, for electricity or waste or waste management and stuff like that. Or McDonald's, for example. McDonald's has tons of waste per day, right? So what you could do is you can see entire energy and waste consumption uh, globally, or you can zoom in right down to the level of a single wall socket. So it goes from all the way to this is how much we are doing across the U.S., all the way to this specific building on floor seven, room four, Conference room wall B, plug two. And you can go all the way down and see, okay, this is, for whatever reason, this socket is expending three times more electricity than any other house. What's happening? And then you say, okay, this is uh, this one has a vending machine plugged into it uh, that's <laughs> consuming a lot of electricity. So what you can do then is turn it off during night. So there's no one in the building during night. So you turn it off at 10 p.m. And then turn it back on at 6 p.m. So, for example, um, so that was a very, very specific, very data heavy uh, project that I'm going to have at the ready. So, when they say, okay, we have a lot of charts and data, I'll say, oh, well, I did a lot of charts and data. Here you go. Uh, and I love those dashboards and drill downs and filters and how we can display stuff. Uh, and I know when I'm talking about this to a people who are not designers and are not developers, it sounds kind of boring. Uh, but I know that all of us can geek out around how are we going to display this massive amounts of data and how are we going to filter it down and how are we going to make the people using the software their, their lives easier. But to answer your question, yes, I, I prepare portfolio for the company specifically, but also I have it already some of my favorite things, especially if you want to talk from a perspective, not necessarily of a product itself, but from the challenges that you face and, and solve. Because there are problems that are transferable in terms of delivery, communicating with the team, communicating with the stakeholders, and those things. The product may not necessarily be similar to the client that you're interviewing with, but the challenges are usually same across the board. So you might have people who are on one side interested in one specific area of the product, and then you have like sales and marketing on the other that want to get their thing made and want to prioritize something else. So uh, this will be kind of, you need to solve the problem of communicating with different types of people within the organization. Uh, and th those challenges are transferable across the board uh, regardless. And then you can always talk about that. So uh, uh, yes, and kind of to get it a little bit more back on topic, anything that you've used, so you have had the experience you had. The more junior you are, you've worked on less projects, but you've done something in your, you've probably done something in your life that can be connected to what the client is doing. So even if, you know, they're asking for an engineer to come to work to a software company, which builds a product for tourist agencies, and you worked in a hotel during summer when you were 16, that's useful experience. Regardless of the fact that you don't have experience developing software systems for tourism, but you've worked there, you know what an allotment is, you know that uh, the checkout time is at 11. So if you book a room until the 21st, that means that you've booked it until 21st at 11 in the morning, and then the next person can book it from the 21st at 11 in the morning. So you know stuff from the industry, or you know somebody who's worked there, or you know you've used it. You, you know, like if you're applying for a job in, I don't know, you want to work for Skyscanner, then you can go and say, hey, I've used in my past uh, five trips, I've used this side, this side, this side, this side. They suck. They suck because of this. And I really want to work in Skyscanner because of that. So you always have some sort of experience that can be relevant for the industry. And again, prepare these stories. Think about 
what life experiences and position experiences, career experiences that I have could be relevant for the position. Yes. True. Another topic regarding interviewing. Uh, do it at home tasks or do it live tasks. I have opinions, but I would love to hear yours. That's a... Oh, man, I don't know, because it's hard, I think, to decide on person's level of skill on a quick task, whatever it is, when it's live, right? If it's live coding, same thing. A lot of people do not perform well under pressure. And when you put them on a spot, I think you don't necessarily always get, get the true level skill of the person. And I've worked with amazing people, amazing developers who are, some of them are extroverted loudmouths and that could ace the live coding. But I've worked with some people who are amazing developers, but they need their own peace and quiet, their own concentration. And when you put them on a spot, they just freeze up. And it same goes when you're in school and somebody calls you out in front of a in front of a blackboard and then you, know, you, you have to speak with it in front of everybody. Some people just tense up and and I think the live coding, live doing anything is out of context and it doesn't necessarily show your real skill. And then for, for taking home tasks, again, um, I would do it. So when I was a, when I was more junior, I would do anything to get a job. But now I feel that my time is so valuable and I kind of come from a position of fuck you, pay me. And I'm not solving any of your issues if you're not paying. So if you want me to do a quick demo test for you, fine, no problem. I'm going to issue an invoice. This is what you're going to pay. I'm going to deliver. And then if you're not happy, I'm sorry. Uh, find somebody else. But I'm not working for free for anybody anymore. I would rather play with Legos than work for free. Uh, okay, so I agree with you, sort of. So giving tests and tasks, if you're interviewing somebody for a senior position, makes no sense. Because if you make a task that's going to actually test the level of seniority that you are requiring from a senior developer, then it has to be something that's mind-boggling challenging. And A, it's going to take you time to think of a task. B, if you're asking something that's going to challenge a senior, then it's not going to be something that he's going to do in two hours. It's going to be something that you're going to, they're going to do in like three weeks. And you don't want somebody to work three weeks for free for your project. So doing that for a senior makes no sense. And when I'm interviewing for seniors, I just tell them, hey, choose a part of your code on a project that was challenging for you. Choose a part of your code that was, I'm talking, of course, about testing developers. Uh, choose a part of your code that was challenging for you, that was interesting for you, and that you are proud of how cleanly you've developed it, how cleanly you've architected it, and how cleanly you've built it. And after you do it, you know, you're going to show it to me on an interview and we're going to talk about it. But if you're a junior, then you probably don't have that yet. So if you're a junior, I like to challenge you with a algorithm task or two. And, but this is something that I don't know how others do it, but this is how I do it. And I used to be a part of TopTel. I was a head of a screening team um, there. We had a severe uh, screening test that consisted both of live coding and uh, coding at home. But we wanted all our screeners to be very senior. And we wanted all our screeners to be aware exactly of the fact that you mentioned that live coding when somebody's watching over your shoulder at every move you do is not the same context as it is when you're, you know, alone in your room doing your thing. So each of the screeners had full uh, um, liability, full liberty to say, okay, this guy didn't solve the tasks that we gave them, but... I'm confident by looking at their approach, I'm confident they're a great developer. And this is why I passed them on the test, even though they officially didn't pass the test. And it's a rare thing, of course, you have to have an uh, explanation for why you would do that, why you would think that you would need a second pair of eyes to take a look at, you know, 
it's not like okay i can let anybody in. but you do have this closure and this is the thing that matters i don't care if you've actually written the two four loops that are required to do whatever it is you need to do but i do care that when you're talking to me and when you're live coding that you tell me okay now i think that i should approach this problem from this angle and do that I'm going to do it like this. Okay, that doesn't work. Why doesn't that work? I'm going to debug it. Okay, here in the debugger, I see that it doesn't work because of this. Ah, so that's what's happening. Damn, now I need to change my approach. Okay, now I'm going to do this. And then, but for me, as a potential employer, I don't care if you're going to do it. I care that you understand and that you have an approach that's going to end up with a result. Same thing with, you know, uh, do an at-home test. I won't give you to do like a three week test, but I could give you a to do list. And I don't need your to do list. I'm not going to take your to do list and become rich by building and using all of the to do lists that I have from all the people and building an AI that then builds the perfect to do list app. And then, no. But I am going to see how you structure your code. I am going to see if you write unit tests or not. I am going to see if you. You know, if your controllers are thin and then you have a service layer, I'm going, I'm going to see, I'm going to see a bunch of things about your approach. And then when you come to to a job interview to show me, then I can ask you, okay, so this is what you've done. Why did you choose this? What? Again, there's at that point, especially when interviewing juniorish people, I don't care about correct or incorrect. I don't care about right or wrong. I care about you understanding what you've done, you having an opinion why you did it, and you. Uh, uh, understanding why, what are the pluses or the minuses from it. So this is why I think at-home tasks do have a value, but they shouldn't be in place to torture people and they shouldn't be in place to, uh, uh, you know, how to say this nicely, to insult their level of seniority. And actually, quite recently, there's also a person, a friend of mine who was had a screening in Toptal. He actually uh, uh, got in there right after I left. His name is Tomislav Batzinger. And he, I don't know if you know him. Of course. Shout out to Tomislav Batzinger. But, yeah, if he's listening, shout out to Tomislav. We're going to make him listen. So, <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, in the recent few weeks, he's been posting a lot on LinkedIn about how the technical interview process in the world is broken. And he has really interesting thoughts. So go on LinkedIn, find Tomislav Batzinger, check out his recent series of posts on the technical interviews. It will give you a very interesting perspective. Yeah, I've seen his post lately and I would agree. He has some really great uh, insights. We got to actually start linking to stuff that we talk about in the description of the episodes. I promise we're going to start doing that. Uh, I want to ask you from a perspective of now business owner, how does your interview experience working with developers turns into explaining the value that you bring as a development agency to a client? How do you transfer the knowledge? Like, how do you tell them this is what we're doing in a way that it's going to be great for you if necessarily they are not a developer on the other side, right? So, but... Uh, this is why I said in the beginning that this is a show, an episode about interviews. A lot of the concepts are the same. Uh, you have to do your, you have to know your pitch about you, and you have to have it prepared. You don't want to come and say, "Hey, I'm uh, Mario, and uh, I'm running um, our, you know, we have a, uh, how, how to say this, we have a uh, development agency." You want to have that like a song, but a song that you've sung so many times that it comes natural, you know, like, hey, I'm Mario, we're doing this. Da, da, da. The next thing, you want to prepare, you want to know who you're talking to so that you can tell them, you, uh, you can tell them what you've done. And one of the biggest things when doing sales, actually, in my opinion, is building trust. So when you're applying for a job, then... Trust is built sort of through a references, but trust is assumed that that's going to be shown after I hire you. You're going to show me that you are actually what you do. In B2B contract, it's not necessarily so because the competition is uh, uh, different. So you have to try and build trust 
in advance. And building trust in advance is best done by your references. So whenever I pitch, uh, uh, I have a software company called Intelligence. And whenever I pitch them, I name several of the biggest accounts that we have. Uh, even though they're not necessarily out of what our client is doing. So I would name, I don't know, Simmons, because everybody has heard of Simmons. I would name, in the UK, if I'm pitching to a UK client, I would name which, which.co, because uh, uh, everybody watched, everybody in the UK knows reviews from which.co, uh, which limited. Uh, if I'm working with somebody that's more in an industry, I would mention Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto is the biggest uh, mining company in the world. And just saying those names sort of builds trust. Then I would go on and pitch a few of our references that are relevant to the client. So, for example, if I'm having somebody that wants to have a platform built that connects, uh, I don't know, uh, people having more mice than they want with people needing more mice, I would tell them, hey, we've built a platform that connects people needing translators to, with translators. Hey, we've built a platform that connects people needing Amazon services with experts providing Amazon services. So all of this preparation comes to mind and all of this preparation has to be done. And then in the call, I would ask them, okay, so I see that you did this, 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 because I've prepared and I read about it. What is your problem and how we can help you? And then I'm going to try to move the conversation towards their problem because they, going back to the thing we started with, they don't want to hear about me. They don't care about me. They care about what I can do to uh, uh, for them. And that's why even at the beginning, I kind of try to find out what their pain point is and kind of say, okay, so I understand your pain point and you would need this, 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 and that. And if you give them the sense that you understand their pain point in that initial conversation, then you're somebody they're going to want to talk to again. The concepts are the same. You are selling something. In a job interview, you're selling yourself to a potential employer. In, uh, you know, if you're an owner of a company or a salesman in a company, then you're selling the company and their services to another, uh, to the client. If you are a freelancer, then you're selling yourself to a client. So you're always selling. And everybody thinks sales is something annoying. I don't want to do sales. Sales sucks. Nobody likes doing sales. You do sales on an everyday basis. If you uh, uh, go to a bar and try to uh, uh, pick up a, a potential uh, mate or a potential partner, you're also selling yourself. You're selling, look, look how pretty I am. Look how entertaining I am. You're always selling. And sales is a useful skill that can be, you know, if you're doing a presentation in your class, you're selling. Look at how well I know this. If you're doing a talk at a conference, you're selling. Look at how well I know this. So you're always selling something and uh, uh, the fact that our educational system, creation educational system, hasn't taught you a single thing about selling and presenting yourself and marketing yourself is a little bit sad. So shout out to the creation uh, uh, ministry of education for not putting that in there. Yeah. So everything is sales, basically. That's the. That's the unfortunately. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, and we're going to talk about sales in, in one of the future episodes, absolutely. And we're going to invite a guest who's a sales consultant and a friend of mine who is going to join us already. Looking forward to that. So we're going to have a dedicated topic on sales. And before we wrap up, I just want to share something uh, around sales and hiring and interviewing. Years ago, when uh, I was hiring a salesperson, interviewed a guy, interviewed him multiple people but this one guy stood out and looked like a very capable dude that can do sales for big men uh design and marketing agency and we decided to go with him doing like a three months probation on it was a salary plus performance bonuses so whatever you sell and it was a very genius uh very generous 
I think compensation, I think it was around back then, I think it was around like 30% or something like that. So salary was 30% of sales. That was like really good. And we, we gave him a, uh, a laptop and a phone uh, and like all the, you know, accounts and everything. And then complete freedom, work from home, work from wherever. Your only job is to sell. I don't care where you are. I don't care how much you do it. If you bring us like one client a month, you're good. Like you can do that once, one day a month. You can do that for 30. I don't care. Dude took everything, said, okay, cool. See you later. Uh, and he was like starting on Monday. And we had an office. We didn't have a policy of you need to be in the office. But it was kind of on Fridays. It was let's all hang out in an office, grab lunch, do the thing. And we were very close to a restaurant that did, did Friday. Did, they did like fish and chips and stuff. So we were like, okay, cool. Like, come Friday, we're going to take everybody for lunch. And Friday comes and he doesn't show up, right? Uh, and I haven't heard from him for an entire week. And I'm not a very hands-on manager like I do in my career. So I emailed him like, hey, dude, it's been a week. How's your sales going? Uh, are you coming uh, for lunch on Friday? Everybody's here. We would love to see you. love to hear how your first week went. Nothing. No reply. I was like, okay, cool. Doesn't matter. Monday, uh, follow up with an email. Dude doesn't reply. I call him. Phone is turned off. Uh, at that point, I got worried. Uh, like, I got worried that something happened to the dude. Maybe, uh, God forbid, he had a car crash or whatever. So, like, the phone is off. He's not replying to an email. He seemed like a genuinely nice, decent person, great fit with the company, and, and nothing. So I gave him another day, again, nothing. So I got a little bit worried, and on his CV, he listed his home number, like his home phone number. So I called the home phone number, and his mom picks up, and I introduced myself, and so I employed your son, uh, they're like, I'm just checking the everything's okay. He's been out of touch. <laughs> she says like, yeah, yeah, he's sleeping at the moment. It was like, it was Tuesday, 11 a.m. And, and I was like, okay, uh, can you wake him up? And I would like to talk to him just to see what's going on. Dude comes up to the phone and I, and I said, hey, dude, everything okay? You haven't been, you're not in touch. Your phone is up. What's going on? He's like, oh yeah, I, I, I decided I don't want to work with you and uh, I'm going to keep the laptop and everything. <laughs> that was, I didn't know how to reply to that. I'm like, what? 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 The, like, what the fuck is going? On? Like, this does not happen. This happens only in the movies. If I saw that on the TV, I would say, like, this never happens. This is bullshit writing. This would never happen in real life. And and then I was so dumbfounded. I didn't know how to respond. And and I just told him, like, look, dude, I'm gonna come and pick up the phone and laptop at one point. I have your home address. I know where you live. <laughs> I said, I know where you live. I'm gonna come to your place, just leave it with your mom or whatever. I'm going to pick it up in the next couple of days. And then one day when I was in nearby, I just stopped. Her, her, his mom gave me a laptop in a bag and a phone. I was like, what the fuck happened? So and regardless, he was a great interviewer, responding great to questions, did everything great, nice person. And then something flipped. I have no idea. So you can do everything right. But you got off cheap. I mean, yeah, you like learned you do, in, in a my, week. My so point that, was you that... can do everything right and still screw up. So and still not get the thing good. So so that's fine. No, no. So one thing is preparing for an interview. And then when you do well on the interview, you actually have to do well on the job. <laughs> like, yeah. You can't live off doing well on interviews. Even though just before this talk, Tom and I were talking, there is a guy who's actually written a series of blog posts about how he's abusing the remote industry. He searches for a job, finds a job, and then doesn't do anything, counting that the company will take from one to three months to fire him, in which time he's looking for another job. So he's just actually looking for jobs and passing interviews. And if you like that story, Please don't ever do that because you're going to screw up the whole remote environment and the remote culture for everybody like us who is trying to do a good job at it. So don't exploit the system. The system is amazing. The fact that you can work from your home at your time, you know, uh, uh, with your favorite cup and things like that. That's amazing. And that's the amazing thing that technology enabled us to do. So screwing it up by being a jackass, please don't do that. I would highly appreciate it. And if you decide to do that, 
Tom knows where you live and he's going to come by <laughs> and find your mom. Yeah, I'm going to find your mom and I'm going to kiss her good. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. I'm going to wrap up on that note. This was a very long episode and I think this was great. Uh, I really Cut enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> no, I really, I think this is really great. And everybody who listened to this point, uh, subscribe, hit the bell button, uh, do the thing with a thing and, and share and like and uh, show this to your mom uh, and whatever. <laughs> and, and thank you for listening. And we're going to see you in the next one. So bye. Yes. Enjoy.